Hi guys, welcome to the fourth video in our kinetics unit. This video is going to be about temperature and how it actually affects the rate constant. This is all based out of section 14.5 in your book, so if you have additional questions after watching the video, I would highly recommend going back and taking a look in your book, specifically focusing on those um, practice problems. And so, when looking at temperature and rate, most reactions speed up as temperature increases. Um, and an example of this would be plants growing more rapidly um, in the summer than in the winter. So when we look at the rate law, we see that the rate law has no temperature term in it at all. So the rate constant has to depend on the temperature, right? Because when you write the rate law, we don't have temperature in it. Rate law is talking about differential rate law. Um, so then our K has to somehow depend on temperature. Well, what we actually see in the lab is we see an approximate doubling of the rate when we increase the temperature by 10 degrees Celsius. So every time we increase the temperature by 10 degrees Celsius, we essentially double the rate. Now we can observe the effects of temperature on rate by looking at glow sticks in water, and we did this in class before. We actually look at a higher temperature versus a lower temperature, and we see that it, it's much brighter in hotter water because the temperature is increased. So there has to be some explanation of why rates are affected by concentration and by temperature. Well, one explanation is provided by the collision model. And we've talked about the collision model before uh, when we talked about how molecules have to collide. So in order for them to react, there has to be collisions between the two. Um, and the greater the number of collisions, the faster the rate. We've discussed this already. Um, when we look at concentration, the more molecules we have present, um, the more likely they are to collide, so the faster the rate. When we look at temperature, the faster the molecules, um, the more energy they have, the more often they collide, and the faster the rate. Now, for a reaction to occur, though, more is required than just a collision. So there has to be the right kind of collision because not all collisions lead to products. There's actually only a small fraction of collisions that actually lead to products. If every single collision um, led to a reaction, then all reactions would be very, very short. So in order for a reaction to occur, um, the reactant molecules have to actually collide with the correct orientation and with enough energy to form. So they must collide, but they must have the correct orientation and enough energy to form products. So looking first at the orientation factor. So the orientation of a molecule during a collision um, can have uh, a profound effect on whether or not a reaction occurs. So if we actually look at this reaction between Cl, so the green um, sphere is Cl, and then we have NOCl. So if Cl actually collides with um, the chlorine in the compound, we actually can produce Cl2 and NO. So if the Cl's collide, we form Cl2. However, if the Cl collides with the oxygen in the compound, they actually don't form any products. So in order for a, a reaction to occur, not only do they have to collide, but they have to collide correctly. So proper orientation is essential so that the molecules come in contact with each other in the correct place. Um, and then with these... Um, with these collisions, with this orientation factor, we also have to make sure that they have enough energy. And that gets us into um, activation energy. So in order to have an effective collision, they have to have proper orientation and they have to have enough energy. Um, so in 1888, a Swedish chemist named Svante Arrhenius um, came up with the idea that molecules have to possess a minimum amount of energy in order to react. So in order to form products, we have to have this minimum amount of energy, and that's because when we break bonds, it requires energy, right? Think about if you're breaking a stick, it requires you to put energy in. Remember when we talked about um, bond energy, the bonds broken minus bonds formed is equal to the overall heat of reaction. Now, if molecules move too slowly and they have too little kinetic energy, they actually don't react when they collide. Okay, they simply bounce off of one another. So they don't have enough energy in order to react. So they don't have that minimum amount of energy. 
And that minimum amount of energy is called activation energy. Okay, this is the minimum energy, energy that's required to initiate a chemical reaction. And this activation energy varies from reaction to reaction. It's never the same. So if we look at activation energy, we're just going to think of an analogy. So we have a golfer, okay, and then we have this hill that's a barrier between um, the ball and the hole. So in order for the ball to get over this barrier, in order for it to get over the hill, um, the golfer has to put in enough kinetic energy in order for the ball to move up and over the hill. So just like the ball can't get over the hill without enough energy, a reaction can occur unless the molecules have enough energy to get over the activation energy barrier. Now, when we look at activation energy, we actually look at what are called reaction coordinate diagrams. Um, and these are graphs, they're, they're visuals that help us to look at energy changes. And what they do is they graph energy versus the reaction progress. So here's an example of an energy diagram. We have energy on the y-axis. We have reaction pathway. This is essentially just um, the progress of the reaction. So we start with our reactants here we end with our products down here. So this shows the energy of the reactants and the products. It also shows us the activation energy. That's this hill that we need to get up and over. And then it also shows us the change in energy during the reaction. All right, so this delta E is the change in energy. This shows us if it's exothermic or endothermic. So with this diagram that was on the last slide, we can look at um, a few different parts. So energy is required to stretch the bond and break the bond between the CH3 group and the NC triple bond. So we need energy to break this bond. Now up here at the top, we have what's called the activated complex or the transition state. We don't actually see this in a reaction, but this is almost like an in-between between our reactants and our products. Okay? It shows um, the in-between, essentially we've already broken bonds, but we haven't yet formed the bonds that we need. Um, and then this shows us that when we form this new bond, energy is released. Okay? Now, the reason energy is released is because notice that our reactants have a higher energy right, higher energy than our products. So our products have a lower energy. They don't need all the energy that the reactants had, so it's going to release energy. This would be an exothermic reaction. Okay, then the change in energy okay, is simply the difference from the reactants to the products. So we started with more energy than what we finished with, so it was exothermic. Now the activation energy okay, is the difference between the reactants and this transition state. So from the reactants to the peak of the barrier, that's the activation energy. That's the minimum energy that we need in order for this reaction to be initiated. Okay, so when we look at this activation energy and we want to relate this back to reaction rate, the rate depends on the magnitude, it depends on the value of this activation energy. The lower this barrier, the faster the rate. It doesn't need as much energy, so it's much more likely to occur. The higher this barrier, the higher the activation energy, the more energy that you have to put in, and the lower the rate, the slower the reaction. Okay, so how does this relate to temperature then? So we've looked at this energy diagram, okay, and we saw that this is exothermic, right, because our products have lower energy than our reactants. Um, now, the reverse of this would simply be endothermic. If we just flip this around, this would be endothermic because our reactants would have lower energy. We would need to put energy in. Now, when we look at this activation energy, what's the whole purpose of a catalyst? Well, the purpose of a catalyst is to um, increase the rate. Well, what would we have to do to activation energy to increase the rate, to make it faster? We would have to lower this. So what we would have to do for this to be a lower rate is we would have to simply lower the activation energy. So a catalyst actually lowers the activation energy. Um, 
So the lower the activation energy, then the faster the rate. So how does this all relate to temperature, right? This video is supposed to be all about temperature and, and rate. Well, at any temperature, the molecules have an average kinetic energy, right? Um, and temperature is simply a measure of kinetic energy. Um, some molecules have less energy than the average. Others have more. But temperature is average kinetic energy. Okay, molecules that have an energy that is equal to or greater to the activation energy will react. What we can actually do is we can actually figure out what fraction of molecules have the energy that is needed. And we can use this equation. So F is simply the fraction of molecules. This E, this is the inverse of natural log. So this is the second natural log on your calculators. Um, you take that to the negative activation energy over RT. So R is this 8.314, temperatures in Kelvin, activation energy is in joules. And what we can actually do is we can actually visually look at this on the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution graph. Now, we looked at this in our gases unit because we talked about fractions of molecules and kinetic energy. So what this shows us is this shows us at a specific temperature how many molecules have the correct activation energy. So at the higher temperatures, a, a larger number of molecules have enough activation and or have enough kinetic energy to react. Okay, so a larger fraction will have more be more likely to have the activation energy. Um, at lower temperatures we don't have as many molecules that have the sufficient energy needed uh, to initiate a reaction. So at a higher temperature, more molecules have activation energy um, and the rate is faster. Okay, so now coming back to Arrhenius, um, he discovered that most of the rate data um, obeys an equation that's based on three factors. So he found this equation that relates number of collisions the fraction of collisions with correct orientation, and the fraction of colliding molecules that have sufficient energy. And what we have is we have the Arrhenius equation. So the Arrhenius equation essentially lets us find the rate constant if we know this constant. So A is this frequency factor. It is how many molecules um, have the collisions um, with the correct orientation to react. So A is simply a constant. You would be given A. It's this frequency factor. Um, EA is your activation energy. R is your ideal gas law constant. T is temperature. So if we had activation energy um, and the frequency factor, we could actually find K. Or if we have K, R, T, and the frequency factor, we can find activation energy. So this Arrhenius equation actually lets us solve or lets us compare the activation energy needed to the rate constant. Now there's a more useful version of this Arrhenius equation and what we can do is we can take the natural log of both sides and the equation becomes this. We have the natural log of K um, and then we have natural log of the frequency factor. Now this looks much like the equation of a line, y equals mx plus b. So a graph of natural log of K versus 1 over t, okay, so natural log of the rate constant times 1 over temperature, notice it's capital T, um, will be a straight line with a slope of negative Ea over R. What this shows us is R is always a constant, so we can actually find the activation energy. So if we actually determine K at several temperatures, um, like you'll do in the lab, we can actually calculate the activation energy from the slope by using um, this graph. So we can actually plot K at several different temperatures in order to determine the activation energy for that reaction. So this is actually the more useful version of the Arrhenius equation. This is what you would want to know, right? How do you use the Arrhenius equation or why do you use it? Well, you use it to determine the activation energy um, of a reaction by comparing K to temperature. Now, if we select two points on the line, so one over uh, the temperature and then natural log of K, and we rearrange the equation, we get something that looks like this. And you can actually see the rearrangement in your text if you want. But this is useful if we have two different K values and two different temperatures, and we want to find the activation energy. So maybe we don't have a full graph, 
but we have two Ks and two temperatures, we can still find the activation energy that is needed for a reaction to occur. So that is it for this video. Um, if you still have some questions, I would highly recommend just taking a look at section 14.5 in your book just to make sure that you can you can see this information in another way. Um, if you still have questions after that, just write your questions down in your notes, bring them to class, and we can go over those.